You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. 6, Benton, 123, 99, 32, 27. That hasn't changed. That's where we lost it again. The energy and tension at the Board of Elections on Tuesday night was palatable for candidates and volunteers who had worked for months to get their message across. So every time a winner came through the door, it was time to let off some steam and celebrate. Nobody had more to celebrate than the two newest members of Cincinnati City Council, David Pepper and David Crowley, neither of whom had ever run before. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Some people have reacted to the fact that on Tuesday, despite all the turmoil in the city over the past year, Cincinnati voters returned all of the incumbents to both the City Council and the City Board of e Cincinnati Board of Education. On one level, that is surprising. I have to admit, going into the vote, I thought Republican Council Member Chris Monzel would be defeated, but he squeaked into the ninth position. But I think there is another way to read the result. In both the Council and the School Board races, something surprising happened. Newcomers finished first in the field. For School Board, Melanie Bates, who admittedly has run for other offices, topped the field of eight. And in the council race, political newcomer David Pepper headed the field of 26. In its own way, I think this can be read as a sign that the voters want a change, but they can only focus seriously on a few names each election cycle in these crowded field races. I am joined this morning by David Pepper, uh, and one of the two new members of city council. David is 29 years old, the son of P&G President John Pepper, not unimportant. He is a Democrat and an attorney. David clerked for federal judge Nathaniel Jones and lived in St. Petersburg, Russia, where he worked on urban economic development under former National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski. David, welcome to Newsmakers. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I gave a little bit longer introduction there because I, than I normally do because I think it's interesting now that you're elected for people to hear, especially the international uh, part of your career. We'll, we'll come back to that. You went through this election. This is the first time you've ever stood for office. Right. Um, what is it that you learned? What, it, what was the most encouraging part of what you learned about the process of running for public office? I think the most encouraging thing I learned was, was first that hard work pays off. We've been, we've been running for well over a year now and met so many people. And I think meeting those people in the face-to-face -face, uh, front door way that we did really, really did work. And I also, the other encouraging thing as we have such wonderful people in this city. I was welcomed into homes. I shared burritos and pizzas in people's kitchens as they invited me in. We have a great group of citizens in this city. And it's easy to forget that with all the problems we've had. But I was so energized and encouraged by the way we ran our campaign and by the way I was, was treated and responded to across our city. And it, it, it was an exciting year and I really enjoyed the year of campaigning than I did. You know, a lot of people from outsiders' point of view think that maybe campaigns are just down to running 30-second commercials right. on TV. But in some cases, you still go door to door, you still talk to lots of people. Do you have any sort of sense about how many people you talk to in a one-on-one -on -one personal sort of way? Um, that'd be hard to guess. I do know that our count was that we knocked on at least 5,000 doors, and that's we talked to more people than that at their doors, but about at least 5,000 doors, and that was knocking on doors almost every night since May. I know I left a note on your door up in College Hill, um, and, and it really was, a, like, like I said, it's a great way to campaign. I think when you look at the numbers, you're, you'll see that where we walked, we actually did get a lot more votes, and it was nice to see that that makes a difference, because it, certainly you have commercials and you have other things you need to do, but there's still, it's still a time, I think, where, we, where the one-on-one -on -one grassroots really makes more of an impact, especially when we've had a tough year in this city and people want to really know and trust the people they're electing. Uh, one of the things is about your campaign, and you really were out there knocking on doors early, and I mean, I, everybody I talked to said, you know, David Pepper is working harder than anybody we've seen in a long time, and it obviously paid off for you. But you also had money to buy the mm -hmm. TV, to mm -hmm. put the yard signs out there, to all of that sort of thing that goes with it. How much right. money, I know the final accounting isn't right. in, but about how much money were you able to, to raise? I think our final, our final number will be about $290,000 uh, total, which is obviously a lot of money. And, and, and I think, obviously, elections that co do cost too much today, a lot of that is driven by TV. 
One thing we did, though, which I hope people will see as they look closely, that we raised money uh, in, in a very careful way. We didn't take any large contributions. We had set our own, our own limit on contributions early on, and we stuck to that. And so I think hopefully people will respect that, even though that is a lot of money. You know, you might not have realized it, but we were showing some oh. uh, of the footage you sent out from the day that you uh, announced your petitions had been right. submitted. The interesting thing there was you didn't have to, you had enough money that you didn't have to trust that the media would show up. You sent us uh, ready to put on TV media, plus you had invited Elizabeth, uh, whatever her name is, Lewarski. from the from survivor to yeah. be there, which of course attracted media attention. Right. So, you know, you had the money to do that, but you also did the other part of the right. campaigning as well. And I think you see, you see from results of this election and also past elections, such as when Alicia Reese did so well last time, that sure money makes a difference, but also just being out there uh, makes, makes even more of a difference. And a lot of things come together at the end of an election. We had more people on voting on election day say to myself or volunteers, we met him at, the, at our door, we met his volunteers at our door, and that, that really all, it does all come together. So it's Obviously, money is important, but there's a lot of other things going on. One too. of the implications here is that one of the things that's still hanging in the balance is issue six, right. which was campaign finance reform. Right now, at the end of Tuesday night, it's 23 votes short of passing out of 80,000 right. votes. Uh, and <clears throat> I have talked to a number of political leaders on both in both Republican and Democratic parties who said, and there's still votes to be counted, the walk-in right. votes. Right. So it still may pass, and if that thing passes, it's disastrous for the city's budget. They, nobody really thought this thing was going to ever had right. it, have a chance. If that passes, do you see a uh, repeal going on the ballot? Would you support that? I could see that. I'm, I, I was surprised that it was as close as it was, and I, I'm a believer in campaign finance reform. I've written about it in the past. I, like I said, I raised money in a way that I applied uh, very, I hope, people see reasonable limits on what individual contributions I would take. But I do think the second aspect, the public financing, uh, wasn't well thought out. There are problems with it. And um, I, I'm not sure the voters, uh, maybe, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I'm not sure everyone knew all the details of that. But, but I think we'll play it by ear and see, see what happens. I have to tell you, I had, I had three different people talk to me Tuesday night and Wednesday morning, said, we thought we knew about that. and they walked in thinking they were going to vote against that because of the public financing side coming out of the general budget, right. got in there and the, the ballot language hardly hinted at it. They mm -hmm. wondered if it was the same issue and right. it's really a confusing sort of thing. Let's go on to some other things here. As a Democrat, how much the Democratic candidates for council and Lucan really mm -hmm. talked during the campaign about a common agenda, a common vision? Or are you all out there just on your own? Well, t to be honest, we didn't, I think w we'll anticipate doing that, but we were all more worried about our campaign. And so I think we will be working together, and I think it won't just be Democrats. I think we'll, we have a, a very reasonable set of people on this council and be working uh, probably across party lines as much as we can as well. Um, so we didn't, we didn't sit down and hammer through a common agenda. I think Mayor Lucan obviously started the process of setting out that agenda a couple days ago, and that we'll be working with that. And it will be his agenda. I think that, that the new structure demands that. I think that's a healthy thing to have him be the pivot person setting the agenda and we try as much as we can to work with him to get it through. I think that was so important that the day after the election, uh, Charlie Lucan calls that conf news conference, announces Alicia Reese mm -hmm. as vice, uh, vice mayor, sets out that agenda, which is so different than in past years. We spent the, the month from the election to December 1st in backroom meetings, everybody saying who's going to trade everything off. Right. The world is different with this right. new mayor. So let's, let's take a look at some of those proposals okay. that uh, the mayor has laid out there. Uh, one of the proposals is to do away with the Economic Development Department and move those responsibilities over to the semi-independent Port right. Authority. Now, Economic development has been a concern of yours. You spoke a lot about it right. during the, the campaign. What do you think right. about this proposal? Well, one thing I want to start out this new council doing is not doing the old shoot, shoot from the hip politics where we immediately have an opinion on something and start getting arguments over it. For, I haven't talked to Mayor Lucan about this particular pr proposal or others, so I'm not going to 
make a, a statement as to where I stand on it precisely yet. I think what he's saying, though, and I think it's true, we've got to change dramatically the way we think about economic, uh, economic development in the city. Uh, I talked about this all campaign. We just failed to compete against other cities when it comes to att attracting businesses, retaining businesses. There are a lot of things to do. Uh, he's proposing one, once, one way uh, to start thinking about this differently. There are other things we also should do. And I'm, I'm looking forward to having a very healthy discussion about uh, the po pauses and minuses of moving it to the Port Authority. Um, but like I said, I mean, I think it's very important that he's laid this out as his first priority because we, other cities are actually doing very well economically for the first time in a long time. We haven't kept up, not because we don't have great things here that should make us economically competitive. We just haven't done the job right from a local government perspective. So he, I think it's, it's a good, it, I, I'm happy that he threw that out there at first and that it's starting this debate that we have to engage in as a city. And maybe I'm going to get the same sort right. of response on some of these others, but I want to ask and sort of explore this. One of the things that he raised was city cable. Right. And taking the money that uh, Warner pays the city, right. doing away with city cable and public access, using that money as money for bonding purposes uh, for economic development. Right. Uh, again, not try I know you want to talk to the mayor and I you want to talk to your colleagues, but What's your, what's your reaction to that? I mean, it's clear that, it's clear that we've had very uh, dysfunctional meetings for a long time. We you have said a lot during your campaign, right. too. We, we, have, we have a lot of posturing because of those cameras. We have a lot of, uh, we want public participation. We want public debate. But what, happen, what has happened is that we've lost control of those meetings. And again, I think this is a, I think Mayor Lucan is saying we've got to change that. Um, again, I, I haven't talked to him about the specifics yet, but I'm certainly interested in talking about this idea in other ways, and I know that, that there are other things that other cities have done with the very same concerns to try and make sure we have public debate, and I think that's very important. We need an accountable city government. One way to hold them accountable is to know exactly what they're doing and talking about, but to have healthy public debate. One thing I've talked about throughout the campaign, and one way to make sure we improve public participation, is to have regular town hall meetings out in neighborhoods in the evenings. So we don't just have the same handful of people who show up uh, on Wednesday afternoons. We actually are out in neighborhoods where it's convenient for people to go to. I went to so many great neighborhood meetings where I learned so much from people. Madisonville had an amazing town hall meeting about three months ago talking about frustrations with crime and safety that you don't hear if you only see those, those uh, council meetings. So I'd like to see that. We need to talk about that in a whole lot of other ways to improve the public participation. I have to tell you, whether it's an uh, advantage or a disadvantage of being older than you and being around this a long time, lots of candidates over the years have talked about the need to move council out into the neighborhoods, listen to those neighborhoods right. more systematically. I mean, lot campaign time, everybody goes right, to the, right, the, right. the neighborhood councils. But can you really change that? Right. I'm not talking about... I mean, I'm sure people have talked about it a lot. The reason I talk about it is because that's what I've done for about 14 months. And so much of my platform came from what I heard from people in the neighborhoods who know so much about what they're frustrated about and also understand a lot of the solutions. So I, I'd like to see us do that. Now, I'm not talking about simply having a regular council meeting in a neighborhood. Uh, I'm talking because there's certain business aspects of the meeting that make sense to have as they do now. I'm talking about more of a town hall meeting where we're specifically there to listen. Um, because right now our meetings are at cross purposes at, at City Hall. A lot of us think of them as a place that we get business done. A lot of other people think of it as a place to, that we should listen. And everyone's dissatisfied because of both things are going on at once. I'd like to try and at least have a, an arena where council members and the public know that this is the time and the place for council to be listening mm -hmm. to the citizens. So that's what I'd like to see happen. One of the things I'd like to explore here is, and I mentioned it in your introduction, is this international experience. David Crowley also right. has wonderful international experience in Bosnia, in, in Romania, Croatia. Mm -hmm. uh, both the new people have this international. Right. I don't know how important that was to get right. elected. Right. But you lived in St. Petersburg. Right. You worked on economic development in a very different context. Do you think you learned things there that are applicable back in Cincinnati? I believe I did because we were trying to help the city of St. Petersburg move from its old communist system to, to be an economically competitive city. And what we did is a lot of what we need to do here. We were studying success stories of U.S. cities and specific programs that had worked in the United States in specific cities 
in, in explaining and trying to convince St. Petersburg to undertake those same steps. And a lot of the things I've talked about, the need to have a more responsive city government that treats businesses that come through as clients, the need to have, have a much more clear process of doing business with the city. This is exactly what we were trying to tell and, and, and really St. Petersburg sp started to adopt with the work there. So that was important. I also think, though, that in the longer run and in the bigger picture, we need to think of ourselves as an uh, international player as a city. Um, and I don't think we do now, but we have global companies here, both in Cincinnati and the broader region. And if we're going to compete in this very global world, we need to be internationally focused. And that's a longer-term priority of mine. Yeah, the irony of that, it, just a few weeks ago, certain people on council, uh, certain members of your party, Rec uh, recommended the doing away with the sister cities program. Right. You know, which is our tie to seven cities. Right. What do you think about that? Well, I think they were recommending, I think, just eliminating the, the city budget portion. And again, I'm going to get into that whole question when we start looking at budget. I've frankly been involved with the World Affairs Council and sister cities. I think they, they do play a very important role in our city. And I'd, I'd like to, and I've talked about this before, both before I was a candidate as well as as a candidate. We've got to make sure that we're an international friendly city. I mean, there are a lot of people from other countries that live in this region. We'd reverse a lot of the population loss if we were able to convince them to live in the city. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's, it's a clear priority over, over time. I mean, I don't think it's one of our near-term uh, goals. We've got a lot of issues to deal with, but it's certainly a long-term priority. Well, David, good to talk to you this morning. Look forward to having you back a okay. lot in the next couple of years. I'd and good luck that. on council. Thanks a lot, Dan. Thank you. Stay tuned. After the break, we'll talk to some people who are dealing with the, the higher incidence of gang terrorism in our neighborhood. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Traditionally, the message has always been that compared to other big cities, Cincinnati did not have a significant gang problem. But since the April riots, as streets in certain Cincinnati neighborhoods have erupted with a steady stream of shootings. Much of that activity has been blamed on increased gang activity, gang initiations, and turf battles among gangs. What do communities need to know about gangs and what can citizens do to control gangs? That's the focus of a series of workshops that have been sponsored uh, this fall by the Cincinnati Hamilton County uh, Community Action Agency entitled The Seven Deadly Sins of Gang Culture and Gang Care. I am now joined by two people who are conducting the workshop. Rufus Johnson is the president and CEO of The Real Truth Incorporated, and Lou Rogers also works with The Real Truth Incorporated and does a lot of, uh, uh, what, what, uh, what's the right term, Lou? Martial arts training. Martial arts training, and we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, Rufus, what does the average citizen not know about gangs that we ought to know? Uh, the average citizen should know more of awareness and signs, symbols, and colors, and to be able to identify the different signs, symbols, and colors in the community. So, I mean, we've all heard about gang signs. We've all heard about colors. In other words, we need to be able to recognize that that sort of stuff is being flashed, is going on, and just be aware that it's out there. Well, just as well as, as, as we deal with gang terrorism, you know, it's the same thing. You know, we got to know what's going on among our youth and what's going on among in our community. Lou, is gang activity, from your perspective, a real tr problem in this city? You know, there, we, get, we have gotten mixed messages. Mm -hmm. We've gotten the message that it's not a big deal. In recent months, we've gotten the message that it's really on the increase and is significant. What do you think? Yeah, it is. It, it can be a very uh, big threat because uh, one reason is is that they form sort of like a family, okay? And uh, they get attached to that type of family and not the family in which they was birthed from. And yes, it can lead them to do uh, wrong things like uh, criminal acts, crimes, um, and it can cause the economy to be on the rise and, and a lot of violence. And that's what my program is, is to deter them from that and to get into martial arts training. And yes, it, it could be a, definitely a, a problem. Uh, Rufus, what is it that makes <coughs> you or Lou or any person an expert or know anything about gangs? Why, why is it that you feel you have a message that you can really tell people? Um, the Real Truth Incorporated has been founded since 1989, and I've been doing a lot of intervention and training uh, with social agencies, uh, institutions, uh, for the last 15 years 
and have firsthand experience and knowledge on what to look for, how to uh, basically go in to uh, help coordinate uh, the Bring Them On piece with different uh, uh, organizations uh, such as uh, the Midwest, the East Coast, and the West Coast. What about in a neighborhood? If you were working with a neighborhood council in Cincinnati, and I'm besides just helping a them understand. A neighborhood council? Yeah. Community council? You community about? council. Okay. Yeah. What would you, besides just being more aware of signs and colors, what would you tell them that they could do positively? What wow. action could they take that really makes a difference? I mean, it, first of all, we have to unify, you know, uh, unify on what's the problem that's actually happening in the community. Uh, that's is dealing with uh, any resident or community council or any community. And um, that seemed to be a lot of uh, uh, different problems, you know, Cincinnati lacks, you know, it's a unification, you know, working as a team. I'm not trying to say so much gang organization is to the point where it's, uh, um, it's, it's being controlled here in the community. It's just the game. It's just the mentality, the awareness of that youth is taking on. You know, just like the rise, you had over 100 and what uh, about 105 shootings. So that that happened since the unrest or the rise. Uh, you just stated it was well, it's gang activity. But then my question would be, which one of these particular organizations? Uh, was was so much involved. You know, I have worked closely with the Cincinnati Police Gang Unit, and they, you know, really didn't have a, a, a handle on, you know, what was happening. But when you look look at gang mentality and, and gang organization, just don't look at it from a community perspective. Look at it from an institution perspective, and just as well as uh, uh, looking at it from a corporate organization. Okay. Lou, one of the things that you do is you try to give a diversion, an alternative to gang activity through the martial arts. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Why is that a good way to channel that energy? Because um, my, myself, I've been in martial arts for like 30 years, and if I hadn't have been in martial arts, I would be potting on the street, be a part of a gang, or uh, some type of negative organization, okay? Uh, martial arts keep you off the street because it keeps you busy. It also provides mentor, mentors for you and also training uh, for discipline, uh, self-esteem, uh, self-control, self-awareness. You know, it gives you the confidence and the self-esteem that you need to go out and get the things that you need as far as your, the, the corporate job that you may need, uh, uh, self-employment. Is your experience that you've actually taken people who have been in gangs and moved them into a martial arts environment and changed their way of yes, life? Yes, I have. A gentleman right here has been, <laughs> <laughs> been with me nine years. And, uh, and that's the reason why he's, do he's doing what he's doing now, because of uh, his change in the martial arts helps him to change towards the needs for people. What did martial arts do for you on a personal? What can you say personally? Uh, on a personal level, when I came into martial arts, I think I came into martial arts in 1990. 91, 92, and I trained with Lou Rogers, um, a lot of self-confidence, you know, um, self-awareness, uh, more focus, uh, you know, just as well as staying physically, you know. And I so is that the, those are the same sorts of things we hear educators say that we have to give kids. Are you just saying, are you saying that martial arts for some people can be more effective at that than school? What, no, because you need, you need martial arts in the school system also. So when I came back to uh, uh, my instructor, we, I, I wanted to move martial art as a physical and educational part of the program. Because we can talk about the t solution, but we still need our alternatives. Uh, we need to have uh, more job on the training uh, uh, as uh, ways of people having skills. You know, we're working on different components and putting them type of programs together. So I work with a lot of different consultants on, on the collective just as well as martial art. But martial art to me plays a big part in that, uh, in the program because it keeps you physically and keep you, you know, keep you on top of your toes. Yeah. Uh, we have less than 30 seconds left. Do you think gang activity is growing in Cincinnati in an alarming way? Yes, I think it is. I think it's growing even in the, um, in the community as well as in uh, the homes and other areas because of uh, organizations, people looking for some type of need to be a part of something. So this is something we need to be concerned about. Exactly. Let me just, uh, let me just uh, give a little bit of information here about the uh, workshop that you're running. Another one is coming up sometime later in November. There's a telephone number, 487-5200 on the screen. 
that people can call for more information. So thank you for being here this morning. And thank you for being with us this morning on Newsmakers. Uh, join us again next week to meet the men and the women who are shaping our community for the future. Have a good week.